Doubt does not disqualify us from God's grace, but faith and doubt are a dance. Instead, faith and doubt are a dance. Let me explain what I mean. Now, there was a while back, back when I was a teenager, a young teenager, that my parents took this, this ladder all from the side that used to hang on the side of the barn, a wooden ladder, and put it up against a tree limb that was 20 feet up in the air at least, and said, I, Greg, I want you to climb up there, and I want you to shimmy, shimmy out on there, and I want you to you know, adjust a rope that was tied to the branch. Now, uh, to be fair, they did tie a, you know, rope around me and had it wrapped around another branch and someone was hanging on to it, you know, trying to, you know, keep me safe. They weren't just trying to like, hey, let's see what happens and see if he survives. No, they, they were trying to keep me safe. And, uh, and so, and that made sense to send me. I was a teenager. I liked heights. I could get quite adventurous with heights. And, um, and so they thought, let's send him up. He's still a younger teenager. He's lighter. We can easier to hold. I, it makes sense to me why they would choose to send me up there. But I had some doubts, right? I had some doubts. I doubted that that ladder would actually work, especially when I was told, hey, why don't you step towards the edge of the rungs, not on the middle of the rungs, right? They climb all the way up there. I doubted that the ladder would work for me. I doubted my skills to be able to go out on that limb. I doubted whether the person hanging onto the rope on the other end was going to, you know, successfully hang on to me if I slipped and I fell off. I mean, I doubted a lot in that moment at that time. And so eventually I got up to the tree branch, but I did not go out on it. Instead, I backed my way down and my older brother went up and successfully did it. You can see it was, it was safe enough, right? It could be done. Now, what has been the greatest moment of doubt in your life? That's probably not the greatest moment of doubt in my life, but it was one moment when I experienced doubt in a number of different things, a number of different situations. Maybe as a new father, you doubted your ability to raise your child well. Maybe in high school, you're in sports, and, and you, you, know, you doubt your skills and ability to, play, you know, to, to accomplish and play as well as you think that, you know, as you would like to do. Maybe you're at work and you're given tasks and you doubt your ability to accomplish that task. Maybe you doubt the goodness of people in this world. Maybe you doubt that doctors really know what is going on in your, in your you know, body, right? Maybe you doubt that they know what they're doing. Uh, maybe you doubt yourself. But maybe it's more than that. Maybe you doubt that God will really accomplish what he says he is. Maybe you doubt that he exists or that he is loving as he is supposed to be or that, that God cares for you personally. Or maybe you doubt that Jesus is not really going to come back to the world like he said he would or, or that God could really forgive you. Maybe you think that your doubt disqualifies you from God's promises, from God's grace. But maybe, just maybe, doubt does not disqualify us from God's grace, from God's love, from God's promises, but instead, faith and doubt are a dance. And to, do, to look at that, we're going to actually go to the life of Abram. Abram was a man who was considered a paragon of faith, right? A, the shining example of faith. I mean, Romans 4 tells us that by his faith, like, he was considered righteous, right? That, that we talked about that last week, and Hebrews 11 holds him up as one of these People who had faith, an example of men of faith. And so if anyone can teach us about the importance of faith, the virtues of faith in our life, and doubt's role in our life, it's going to be Abraham. And so we're going to look at the life of Abram in a moment. But let's remember where we're at in the passage first. Remember that the world was in trouble, trouble, but God had a plan, right? He chose Abram and said, Abram, I'm, I promise that, that if you will do what I ask, if you will leave your land, leave your country, leave your people, uh, if you will do that and go to the place that I will show you, I will bless you. You will become a nation. You will be blessed. You'll be a blessing to others. I will cause others to be blessed through you. And anyone who treats you with contempt, I will curse. So you're going to have my protection. You just got to give up your community and family and everything and leave and go to the land that I will show you. And so Abram takes God at his word, packs up his wife, his nephew, all of his belongings. They leave um, the place where they were staying and they head to Canaan. And when they get there in Genesis 12, 7, we're told that God said to your offspring, I will give this land. Canaan is the land that I want you to go to. And made it clear that Canaan was going to be his new home. But as we're going to see, not everything just goes perfectly for Abram. 
Not everything goes perfectly for him. So let's pray and let's take a look at God's word today. Father, as I preach your word, as I look at your word today, I ask, Lord, that you would help me to preach it well. And I pray, Lord, for those that are listening and those that are partaking in this sermon, Father, I pray that you would help them to be drawn to you and encouraged. And, Lord, that you would strengthen their faith in you and, and um, their walk with you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. So let's take a look. We're in Genesis chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 1. And it says, there was a famine in the land. Now wait a second. There's a famine in the land. This is God's promised land, but there's a famine there. This is the place that God was calling Abram, but there's a famine there. Right? It's his promised land. And this is one that, that God said, this is the land that I will show you. Go to the land that I will show you. And, and yet there's a famine there. I'm, now here's the reality. Coming into God's promised land is not always what we hope it will be. I can't imagine that Abram said, oh, I'm going to go to God's promised land where there's a famine. Right? And, and sometimes it's that way in our life. We, we step out, we surrender your life to Christ, and, and you become a Christian. What do you find? Instead of everything going your way, life still happens. Your family relationship is still strained. Maybe it's strained worse because of your Christian walk, your faith in Christ now. Um, you're struggling to recover that peace that you, you, law, that you had when you first you know, encountered Jesus. You're like, where'd that go? Instead, your insides are in turmoil. You may be still struggling with your finances. And, and you say, where are the promises that God gave? Where's this abundant life? Where's the peace? Right? Where's the presence? Why is everything so hard? Doesn't Romans 8 tell us that we will be more than conquerors? Well, let me explain just one thing real quick right now. God does not take us out of this world. But instead, He carries us in the midst of the hard. And that means that sometimes we can be surprised when we suddenly have to deal with the brokenness of this world. And Abram travels to the promised land only to be confronted with one of the worst things that could happen in that day and age of famine. I mean, that, that's a really bad thing to happen now too because a famine means, hey, there's no food. There's no food. And can you really hear his thoughts? And you think he's thinking things like, really, God, this is the place that you called me to? This is what you wanted me to come to? A, a, a famine, a place? How can I live here? There's not even any food. And so just as Abram learned, as followers of Christ, our walk with God, our living by the promise, isn't a promise that everything is going to go our way, that everything is going to be just fine. So let's take a look at what Abram does next. Let's finish verse 10. It says, So Abram went down to Egypt to stay there for a while because the famine in the land was severe. So what does he do? Well, he runs away. God said, this is the land that I want you to go to. I'm going to show you a land for you to move to. Uh, this is the land I'm going to give your ancestors. And, this is, and he runs away. And this is the first decision that we see Abram make out of fear. Right? We don't see it you know, for the first 75 years of Abram's life, but in the part of Abram's life that we do see, this is the first time we see him make a decision that is driven by Fear itself. Fear that led him to not trust God's promises, to, that God would not hold up his end of the bargain. That's what his fear was. It's actually a doubt, right? He's doubting God, doubting that the land that he sent him to was not good, doubting that he could live there. And this moment of doubt won't be the last time. I mean, chapter 16, Abram and Sarai doubt God's promise so much that they take that they, they take the action. They try to fulfill the promise in their own power, in their own ways. And sometimes doubt you know, drives us to fear. Sometimes fear drives us to doubt. Whichever the way is, fear and doubt are intricately connected. They're intricately connected. And you know, it drives us to make choices that eventually are going to lead us to sin, right? When you have that conversation with your neighbor and your thought comes into your mind, you should invite them to church, right? And your heart starts pounding uh, and you know, I, you know, in that moment, you should, you should invite them to church, but you choose not to instead because of the fear, because of the doubt that maybe, maybe they're going to respond in a bad way. Maybe I'm not going to say it right. Maybe whatever the case is, and that leads you to fear and that leads you 
to not saying it. And when your job comes in between you and the care of your family or the, the growth of your spiritual walk, your walk with God, it can be fear that stops us from saying, no, I can't work here. I've got to find a different job. Right? Fear debilitates the senses and it drives us to three things, right? Either to, to attack, right? Fear drives us to fight, or it makes us run away, or it makes us freeze up. That's what fear is trying to do. And Abram was a man who ran from his fears. The founder of the nation of Israel ran from his fears. And what is driving that fear? Well, it's doubt. Abram doubts God's goodness. Doubts his ability to provide. And he does, that, he does exactly what his descendant, Jacob, his grandson, Jacob, is going to do uh, when a famine hits the land in Jacob's day, he runs to Egypt. Here's a little hint. Things never go well when the Israelites go to Egypt. The only time it does is when Jesus goes to Egypt. After that, it's never, it's, other than that, it's never been good. Let's take a look at what happens. Look at verse 11. It says, when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, look, I, I know what a beautiful woman you are. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And they will kill me, but let you live. Please say, you're my sister, so it will go well for me because of you. And my life will be spared on your account. Now, many have tried to defend Abram's actions to find some sort of like logical way to make this like, hey, you know what? He was doing something good and beneficial, right? This wasn't a terrible choice. You know, maybe some, but the reality is there's no cultural reason or logical reason that anybody has put forward that makes sense, that, that can honestly defend this action. Instead, Dykes said, no defense can be offered for a man who merely through dread of danger to himself tells a lie, risks his wife's chastity, puts temptation in the way of his neighbors, and betrays the charge to which the divine favor had summoned him. See, when doubt raises its ugly head and we run to fear, we will be tempted to fall back on solving things in our own way. And if our nature is to run when fear rises, uh, then in one way we're like Abram. They're going to be acting like Abram. Abram responded to his doubt and fear by using deception to try to keep himself safe. And we can do that too. That's one of the ways that we can respond to fear in our lives. We, he used lies and clever deceptions because technically Sarai was his half-sister. He just left out the larger and greater truth. And there are other ways that we may respond to fear. Anger being one of the most common. You know that anger is actually a secondary emotion. Often most driven by fear. We get afraid and then we respond in anger uh, to something that is not our own. So anger might be one of the ways we respond to fear. Others are procrastinating or getting super busy and staying busy or surrounding ourselves with others or pushing others away or more. There's a lot of ways that we respond to fear. But how do you respond? Do you lie? Do you attack? Do you try to get people to see things from your way? Do you justify? Here is the man of faith himself, Abram, living in doubt and acting out of dread, fear. And the best that we can say for Abram, the best thing that we can say is that he just simply didn't know that lying was wrong. He just didn't know, right? He, he doesn't know all the things about God that we know. He doesn't have that revelation yet. And, and so he has no way of understanding that lying is one of the worst things that he can do. And, and it tops the list. It's part of the list of God's, you know, 10 lists of things that you should and should not do. Lying is one of those no-no's, right? And he did not know that. So that's the best thing we can say about him. But we do. As children of God, as Christ followers, as Christians, we do. When doubt raises its ugly head and drives us to fear, how do we respond? Well, violence, deception, whatever. How is it? Let's see how Abram's decision plays out. Look at verse 14. Uh, down through 16. It says, When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh. So the woman was taken to Pharaoh's household. 
He treated Abram well because of her, and Abram acquired flocks and herds, male and female donkeys, male and female slaves, and camels. Now Pharaoh sees that Sarai was beautiful. Sarah is beautiful. Now, she is no less than 65 years old at this point in time. Now, what we have to remember is that she actually lives to 127, which means that she's in the middle of her life. She's in her prime. And clearly, Sarai was a real looker, so much so that Abram was afraid to go into Egypt with her. So she was a looker. And Abram's plan works. He is still alive. His wife got taken, but he survived. All right? uh, he, he, his wife was taken. He gets, he gets wealthy off from the deception, but he's alive. And that is what is, was most important to him. His plan worked. He got what he wanted. Ultimately, Abram responds in fear, not just to the famine, but he responds in fear to men. That's why he came up with the lie. And then he responds in fear to the specific man, Pharaoh, one of the most powerful men uh, uh, probably at that time in that age in that community, right? And, uh, and he just simply cannot find it in himself to tell the Pharaoh, no, no, you, you can't have my wife, not even at the expense of losing his wife. He can't. And there, now the promise is in shambles. He's not in the promised land where he is supposed to be, the place that God called him to. Instead, he's in the land where his descendants, 400 years later, are going to be made into slaves. And that's, that's where he ended up. He doesn't have his wife anymore, so how is he going to have children? Can't have children. Can't, can't finish, fulfill the promise to become a nation if you can't have kids. Right? He's alone, and he has to be wondering at some level, how in the world is God going to accomplish his promises now? But the problem is all his. Abram did this to himself. He's broken the promise. He's not trust that God's going to protect him. He's not you know, lived and trusted in the fact that God was going to bless him. He didn't hang out in the promised land that he said, this is the land I want, to, want you to go to. Perhaps he should have stayed in the promised land. I'm not going to argue whether leaving the promised land was you know, breaking the promise, but he definitely should have fought for and defended his wife, and he doubted God. He acted in fear, and he is stuck because of it. And sometimes we think that doubt disqualifies us from God's love, God's promises, God's grace. And it's easy for us to think that doubt is a sin. I mean, there are times in the Bible, like James chapter 1, that says if you want wisdom, to pray for it without doubting, right? If you doubt, then you know, you're not going to receive it, is what he said. So we think, okay, doubting is bad. Or, or the time when Gabriel shows up to Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, and Zechariah isn't able to have kids. Him and his wife Elizabeth aren't able to have kids. And Gabriel, the angel, shows up and says, you're going to have a child. And, and because Zechariah doubts Gabriel, Zechariah is punished to not speak until his son is born but when we study the stories of those who followed God the closest walked with God we find that doubt actually plays a consistent role in their lives Abram the man of faith has let doubt get the best of him and it has left him in a precarious place so let's see what happens look at verse 17 down through 20 it says but the lord struck pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of abram's wife sarai and so pharaoh sent for abram and said what have you done to me why didn't you tell me she was your wife why did you say she is my sister so that i took her as my wife now here is your wife take her and go then Pharaoh gave his men orders about him, and they sent him away with his wife and all he had. Now God promised that he would curse those who treat Abram with contempt. And we see God do that in a powerful way in Pharaoh's life right here. And what we don't know is, how does Pharaoh know that the cause of the curse is Sarai? We're not sure. What we do know is that God is defending Abram. He's acting on behalf of Sarai and Abram. And despite Abram's doubt, it does not disqualify him from God's promises, protection, love, or grace. Instead, even when Abram has broken the promises, moved away from the land that he was led to settle in, lied and given away his wife, God still upholds 
his end of the bargain. God's promises don't end just because we falter. Doubt does not disqualify us from God's grace. In fact, a number of the heroes of the Bible struggle with doubt. Gideon doubts God's call. Gideon doubts God calls him, right? He doubts it. Like, you're calling me? Why would you call me? He also doubts God's clear sign in his, in his life. When he says he prays for a sign, God gives him a clear sign. Right? Job doubts God's goodness. Moses doubts God can feed the Israelites. I mean, look at Numbers uh, 11, 21 through 23. And, Abram and, Nathan, blah, blah, blah. and Moses is like, what? You're going you're gonna to feed all the Israelites meat? How are you going to do that? Peter doubts God while walking on the water. Jesus says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? The disciples doubt Jesus in the storm on the lake, right? Jesus and the disciples are in a boat crossing the lake. Storm comes up and it's like, we're going to capsize and drown and die. And they wake Jesus and says, Jesus, don't you care? And Jesus is like, you know, peace be still. Doubting Thomas doubts Jesus' resurrection. And you know what Jesus does? He doesn't say, oh, well, you can't be my disciple anymore. No, he says, come, come, explore your doubts and find the answers to them. Not once did their doubt stop them from being used by God. Not once did their doubt mean that God didn't continue to show them grace, love, or protection. See, doubts are a part of living, and they are a part of living in faith. Right? Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Do you want me to show you what the opposite of faith is? Let me show you what the opposite of faith is. All right, give me a second here. All right, I have a $20 bill in my hand. How many of you believe that I have a $20 bill in, your, in, in, in my hand? Raise your hand if you, at home. If you think I have a $20 bill in my hand, you go ahead and raise your hand. All right, what do you think? Okay, now those of you who say you have faith in me that I have a $20 bill because you don't have any evidence. There's no way for you to see in my hand. You don't know. You have to take me at my word. So you have faith that I have a $20 bill in my hand. Watch me destroy your faith. All right, I'm going to show you what the opposite of faith is. All right, right there. Oop, I dropped it, All right? See, now you no longer have faith. You don't have faith in the fact that I have a $20 bill in my hand. Why? You have certainty, right? You have certainty. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Certainty is the opposite of faith, right? You and I, we are going to experience doubt, right? You may have at times thought, is God really real? How can God, a good God allow bad things to happen? Am I really doing what God wants me to to do and there's so much more that we can ask and what Abram shows us is that just because we have doubts doesn't mean that God has abandoned us and so what do we do with our doubts well we let our doubts be what they're supposed to be right they're they're a tool to help us grow in our faith instead of letting them drive us into fear let's explore them the worst thing that we can do is say well just have more faith now you just got to have faith Right? Just push those doubts away. Don't think about them. you got to have faith. Right? Here's the reality. Humanity lives by faith. We cannot give up faith. Right? We live by faith. We, everything we do. Right? When we sit down on a chair, we're expressing faith. When we walk on a new piece of floor, we have faith. When we get out on the road and drive down the road, we have faith right? in, in the, these different things. Faith in the floor, faith in the chair, faith in the car, faith right? in, in the air that we breathe. Right? We have faith until we actually sit on them or, or you know, sit on that chair or drive that car, whatever it is. Like we are people of faith. We live by faith. We act by faith. We, we, we didn't live and act by faith, we would do nothing. Right? Faith is not restricted to our belief in God. And sometimes living by faith brings doubts. And doubts do not make us any less worthy of God's grace. Instead of running and hiding from the doubts, we need to bring them out and analyze them and let doubt be what it's supposed to be, a tool for helping us grow. Let doubt guide you to explore and even explore even deeper into your faith. Right? When you're wondering, is God even real? Remember why you believed in him in the first place. Right? Remember that the most logical reason why something exists and why specifically this universe exists remains God. 
Right? Have you thought about why does something exist instead of not exist? Like, like why is there something rather than nothing? Right? The answer to that is still, the most logical answer still remains God. The most logical answer for this universe or the DNA. There's information in our DNA, complex information that makes sense. It's coded. It's logical. Where did that come from? Information has never come from non-information. Never. All right? Right? Still, one of, just one of the many different reasons why it's logical to believe that there's an intelligent designer. And then we remember the times when God has shown up in our life. Right? We don't just have to think about the logical things and the like cold, hard, scientific fact. Right? There's just the reality of the times when God has literally shown up in your life. Remember that. Remember that we can be certain that Jesus existed. We don't have to take that in faith. We know Jesus really lived and died and, and that, that was real. Now, but the most logical thing remains that when we ask what happened after his death, that he really did come back to life, right? It's still the most logical thing. And so when you start having those doubts, dive back into the reasons why you believe. Don't run from your doubts, but instead refresh your faith, right? Don't run from your doubts. Instead, refresh your faith. When you wonder how come bad things happen even though God is good and loving, remember that the bad things that happen aren't because of God but because of human free will. Right? When I open my app to read the news, the majority of what I come across that's bad is because humans are out there acting selfishly, greedily, they're murdering, they're lying, right? they're, they're doing all these sorts of things. Right? That is 90% of my news feed. Right? They're out there blowing things up and stealing and doing all these sorts of things. And then you say, well, what about natural disasters? But he, the Bible teaches that natural disasters are themselves a result of Adam and Eve's fall. And we need to have a larger discussion about natural disasters at some point. Because here's the thing. I believe that natural disasters, the way that we respond to them, actually points to a good and loving God actually points to that. So we're going to have to have a larger discussion on that. We, you know, it takes a little bit longer to talk through that than what we've got time for right now. Now, just out of curiosity, I have to talk about that. How many of you would be interested in me doing a series on apologetics, right, which is the defense of the Christian faith that asks questions and gives answers along those lines? If that's something that you would like, just, you know, write it on your communication card. Let me know. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Now, when you doubt God's goodness or presence, return to the Bible and read again the truths that are found within. Take your doubt to God. Here's the thing. People in the Bible, when they're struggling, they go to God with their prayers and they cry out to God in the Bible. They cry, literally cry to God, right? They don't restrict their emotions or even their doubts toward God, but instead they reveal them. Then I imagine that Abram was in a low place while removed from the promised land and his wife locked away in Pharaoh's harem, right? And he may have been doubting God's goodness, but God came through for him. And we go through these times in life as well when everything seems bad, but the badness of this broken world does not negate the goodness of God. And it does not mean that God is not planning to end this brokenness. That he's not, that just because he hasn't done something yet doesn't mean that he is not planning to. And do not forget that it is with the hard, it's with the difficult times that God helps us to grow. And so when we doubt, we must continue the logical thoughts all the way to their conclusion. When we come into real problems, when we have a doubt, and then we start down the logical path, but we never finish it. We never go to the final conclusion on it, right? And when we do, we find that God remains the best answer. Not only does the biblical worldview make the most sense in this world and has the best historical evidence and logic to support it, Remember the many times that God has intervened in your life. Look, doubt does not disqualify us from God's grace. Abram's doubt led him to a dangerous place, but in the end, God carried him out of it. God carried him out of it. And what we're going to see consistently throughout this series on Abram's life is that Abram is going to do things that threaten the promise or the things around them, situations around them are going to threaten the promise and God is going to show up and defend the promise all the way through. And that's exactly what happens here. God carries him out 
of this situation that he put himself in. But doubts can run rampant in our lives as well. Faith and doubt are a dance. And it's okay to experience doubts, but don't simply run from them. Instead, let logic run its full course in your life. Remember why you believe. Remember that times that God has shown up and see your faith grow stronger. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, to look at the life of a man who was real. Father, he didn't do everything perfect. He didn't respond every time in a perfect way. Sometimes he responded in fear. Sometimes it seems like he doubted you. And yet you carried him through and you showed up in his life. And his doubt did not disqualify him from you. And so uh, from your grace and your love. And so we thank you for that. And you help us, Lord. Lord, the times when we doubt, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to always come back to the point where we know that you are uh, who, really who you say you are. That we come to the final logical conclusion at the end. That you are still good, that you are still loving, that you still exist, and you still have the best in mind for us. Father, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.